Welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Let's talk money. And welcome to the Money Mastermind Show. Tonight, we are talking about creating multiple streams of income. And we have a special guest today. We have Lauren Bowling of LB and the Money Tree. Welcome to our show, Lauren. Hi, thank you. And of course, we have the members of the Money Mastermind Show. We have Kyle Prevo of youngandthrifty.ca, Miranda Marquit of Planting Money Seeds, Peter Anderson of Bible Money Matters, and Tom Drake of the Canadian Finance Blog, and myself, Glenn Craig of Free From Baroque. So, before we start, uh, if you are watching us on our events page, there is a questions app, so if you have any questions regarding creating multiple streams of income, please ask them. We'd love to hear them and love to get them out there for our audience. So, let's say I have a good job. Maybe I'm putting a good amount of that into my 401k, getting a great match. Maybe I'm even putting money into an IRA on top of that. And then, you know, maybe I'm even lucky enough to have a pension as well. So, why do I need to be concerned about multiple streams of income? Okay, so. I guess I'll start. I guess you don't have to, Glenn. <laughs> there you go. That's a show right there. <laughs> Sorry, was I supposed to feel that? I was fiddling with my microphone. I apologize. No, no it's cool. Go ahead, Lauren. Out there, we, go, we, Lauren. We, we have a little bit of a sound glitch here, but we're going to push through it and hope that when the, the podcast version of it comes, we can clean it all up. So, um, with some magic of uh, of the, the the computers here. But um, in the meantime, so so multiple streams of income. Why is that something we need to worry about? Especially, you know, I can understand maybe if you don't have the income coming in, maybe you want to create different things. But if you're doing okay, um, why is that something you still might want to consider? Um, I think it's important to never just have all of your eggs in one basket. I think, especially from the perspective that the economy is different now, um, having extra money can help you accomplish goals faster and you know, protect you in case of emergencies, because those are going to happen, you know, even if you're doing well. I, okay. I think that's a good point, and I like what you say about the economy being different. The days where you can just get a job, and you work at that job for 30 years, and you have a pension, are all over now. There are all these, you know, people are being laid off all the time, and people job hopping. I mean, they're saying that people have you know, between seven and 10 jobs at least over their lifetimes. And so sitting here and saying, oh, well, my day job is stable is never is never going to help you. You need these multiple streams of income to kind of prop you up because you never know if you're going to have a job. And I think that's more true than ever before for especially young people. Uh, some of this stuff might be ringing uh, a little bit tone deaf with people uh, of sort of the boomer generation who tend to, in higher percentages, get to work for one company for most of their life or maybe two or three job switches max. Uh, I think a reality for young people, uh, whether in Canada or the USA today, is more careers. Uh, that seems to be a consistent statistic across uh, pretty much all demographics and regions. Uh, and there's there's just less overall job security. People are on term contracts, uh, part-time contracts, they don't have to pay out benefits, uh, various different part-time jobs. And the only real security comes from uh, sort of constructing your own uh, multifaceted income, I think. Yeah, I think I'm a little different, where, whereas I've, I've been in the same job for 16 years now, so that's not very common these days. So for me, having that multiple streams of income is a little bit different. It's, it's more about having uh, more of a buffer for our family, having uh, more than just my, my one income it, it means we can do other things. You know, we can go on more vacations. We can save for retirement faster. We can, you know, even if, uh, even though I have been at my job for 16 years, you know, there's always the possibility that the company could go under or who knows what. So it's, it gives us that margin uh, for error. Uh, it allows us to do more things. It's freedom, basically. I'm also a lifer like Pete, and uh, it's uh, in in addition to having that extra spending money, it's, it's almost almost like a perpetual emergency fund. Yeah, if if you if you lose your job, you can uh, you at least have something there that can kind of help cushion any time period that you're looking for a new job. 
I think also another thing maybe to consider is um, depending on what you're doing, or maybe it doesn't even depend on what you're doing, but technology is moving so fast that you might think that you have a steady job that's going to last forever, but something, the next thing comes along and all of a sudden what you're doing is almost obsolete. You know, who would have thought something like a Kodak wouldn't exist anymore? You know, the, you know there's so many different things that are coming out and changing that, uh, you know, you can have a venerable company where all of a sudden it just doesn't even matter anymore. Uh, so that's a pretty scary thing. And I like what we're something. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was gonna say I, I, I like you know what, what you guys are talking about extra income. And um, I mean, I guess if you play your cards right, you you can take this extra money and put it aside, and and you can build up your financial freedom a little bit faster. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe you're not at that 65, but you have enough put away that if something happens when you're 50 or 55, you can take that retirement then and there if you have enough uh, put away. You were going to say, Peter? Oh, yeah. I was kind of going back to uh, another problem that a lot of people are having now is that maybe they have their, their advanced degrees and they've graduated from college with these great degrees, but so many people are, are underemployed these days. You know, they have a, an advanced degree, but they're working at Starbucks or something along those lines. So for a lot of those people, having multiple streams of income might almost be a necessity just uh, in order to uh, be able to have a good standard of living. So. Yeah, I, to Peter's point, I think a lot of people, especially the millennial generation, are kind of survival jobbing, jobbing and cobbling together all of these different incomes to make a living that as they age and earn more, having multiple streams of income will become more of the norm. So we know how important multiple streams are now. Um, let's go over what we're exactly talking about when we talk multiple streams of income, like what's involved to to have different sources coming in. I mean, are we talking working two and three jobs or are there other things that we can consider that may not be so uh, constraining on us? Well, I think it really depends on your situation and what you're trying to accomplish with your additional streams of income. If you're just looking to build something up over time, then, you know, a little side hustle or something that you can do online makes sense. If you have a a ton of debt and you're looking to pay down that debt and then build up an emergency fund, then maybe you do for a year or two work an extra job or, or something like that. I think it really depends on what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish with your streams of income. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to pay down a bunch of debt uh, as fast as you possibly can, that's one thing a lot of the uh, debt gurus talk about is getting one or two uh, jobs on the side so that you can uh, pay down that debt faster, you know, getting a job delivering pizzas or a job on the weekend somewhere. So, you know, again, it really it really depends on what your end goal is. If it's just to save a little extra money for retirement, you may not need to get an actual full sec, full-time second job. But uh, if you're trying to pay down on thousands of dollars of debt, you might want to consider it, even if it's just uh, for a, a small amount of time. Yeah, I really like what Lauren was saying uh, about the millennial generation and sort of uh, survival jobbing. And I really like the entrepreneurship angle, uh, the entrepreneurship side hustle that that can eventually turn into your own thing. I mean, if you're a Shark Tank fan or Dragons, then up here in Canada, you sort of you you can sort of see some of those stories. It might be a little cheesed up for the camera, but you see a lot of people that do experience success starting with just the side thing. And I think uh, at least one inevitable, even if you don't get the big Mark Cuban bio one day is you build up resume skills. Uh, it's very impressive to see on someone's resume, uh, I would think, uh, not having been an administrator recently, but I would think uh, if someone had sort of the, um, in, you know, the uh, motivation and, and uh, you know, an internal motivation to go out there and get what they want and create something from nothing, that's pretty impressive if you want to be an employee one day. I would think along what you're saying is, um, yeah, you, you're building up, probably a different level of experience that you wouldn't get uh, just working in a cube farm. Uh, you know, when you have to go out there and do things on your own, you're really kind of pushing yourself in a different way and uh, and forcing yourself maybe to do things that you wouldn't necessarily have exposure to, that even if you weren't using those particular skills to get a job, even if you were just getting another job that was similar to your own, just being able to have that extra uh, cache of skills might be the, the thing that gets you in the door as opposed to somebody else. 
society. Do we have any any other ways of, of creating multiple streams of income? Um, you know. Um, sorry, I'm in real estate. I mean, I bought my house and then I rent out the bedrooms. <laughs> so that's passive income. Go. Are we gonna talk about we can talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean that's that's, that's that's great. I mean we did we recently had Brandon Turner talking um, about real estate and uh, you know I think that's a great example that I didn't even think about when I was writing my notes. Um, but for sure, if you have something where you can rent out another another room or an apartment or a house. Uh, so, so how many rooms do you rent out? Do you actually have the people living with you? How does that work? Yeah, I do. I'm doing. I think what Brandon called it was house hacking, where I, I bought the house, I live here, and then. My brother rents a room, and I have a second one that I I sometimes rent out. Um, but it's a push pull between is it active or is it passive income? Um, because it it does require tending <laughs> from me because I live here. So. Well, I think um I mean a lot of people talk about passive income, and this is income that will uh, generate itself without a lot of work. Uh, but I think there's sort of a myth to a lot of this passive income and now we can easily just create something that's just going to you know, create a lot of money for us but it probably takes a lot of work to get to that point maybe yeah. you know if you could get to where you own a, a number of apartments or houses and maybe you could get some people to manage it and such then it becomes pretty pretty passive but it probably takes a lot of work to get to that point so uh, I was going to uh, say you, you never have really truly passive income unless like somebody bestows an inheritance upon you and you can immediately invest it in dividends or something like that, you know, <laughs> but it's a dividend paying stocks. But yeah, there's no, I, I really don't think that there's, you know, I mean, the IRS has its own definitions of passive income, but as far as, you know, the work that you're actually putting in and, and actually ha not having to do work, I think that's really, really rare to find truly passive income. I think it's the result of all the hard work that you put in. I mean, Bill Gates maybe has, has passive income now. You know, he doesn't have to work for Microsoft anymore, but, you know, he's still uh, reaping the benefits of it. But uh, that's not an opportunity that many of us have at our fingertips. Um, and he worked hard to get there to begin with. Sure. And, and that's what I'm saying. It, it yeah. kills the myth of the whole passive income uh, versus active income, basically. In so, Lauren, mind. do you recommend uh, living with other people in terms of if you're a young person, sort of, uh, it's a good way to build home equity. I know Paula Pant from Afford Anything is a big fan, but there's a lot of challenges involved in that too, am I right? There are, um, especially when you live in the home yourself and you're renting to someone you don't know. I personally wouldn't recommend it, but um, you make lemons, or sorry, you make lemonade out of the lemons that you're given. Um, and it can be a good way to recoup money if you have people you know and you trust. So. I can't recommend it, but go ahead and try it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you live with your brother, right? So yeah. that kind of helps a little bit. It does. It does. I can't complain too much. <laughs> I, I interviewed one guy on one of my podcasts, Sean Cooper. He's sort of become... Uh, uh, I, I, I don't think Sean would mind me labeling him a C-level uh, personal finance celebrity up in Canada recently. He's just finishing paying off his mortgage... Uh, he did like this HGTV-esque type thing where he rented out uh, the top part of his beautiful house in a sort of booming housing market and lived in the basement. And so that was one way he did it, uh, and it was certainly a massive sacrifice. But he uh, he just it goes to show that it it can be done uh, if it's one way. I certainly have uh, sort of top top priority on my housing um, privacy. And won't be pursuing that path of passive income anytime <laughs> soon. But that's just me. Uh, it does work for people. I know that. And I. Oh, well, sorry. I just think. I think all. <laughs> I think all um, streams of income like come at a price. Like whether it's your privacy or your weekend free time, or I think people think it's kind of glamorous to have multiple streams of income, but it's actually a lot of work, um, much like your full-time job would be. Yeah, I was going to say, I think uh, just from experience from uh, posts that I've written on my blog, it, it really seems like people are looking for easy ways to make money. You know, they want they want to find something that's going to start generating passive income with no uh, work on their part, just something that happens and money magically flows into their pockets. But the reality is that 
when you're creating these these side streams of income, there is going to be a lot, lot of work involved with it. I think, for example, a lot of all of us have uh, our own personal finance blogs that generate some sort of an income. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people will think, oh, you just write a bunch of posts and put it up there and leave it there. And it's just going to keep generating income. But the truth is we all put in tons of hours every week uh, maintaining our blogs, writing new content, doing a, an unimaginable number of different things to keep those sites running. So uh, side income, creating side income is not going to be an easy thing. It's something you have to go in with the mindset that I'm going to, I'm going to put in some hard work, but there is going to be some reward at the end. Yeah. When I, when I started my business, it, it started off kind of small, but I don't call it a side hustle or part-time job. I tell people I have a second full-time job because <laughs> it's, it's literally that much time being put in in the evenings and, and on the weekend that it, uh, it really is a, a second full-time job uh, to, to create that extra income. It is interesting how many opportunities there are like that, though, Tom. Like, I know in, in my little niche space, I've met a couple teachers who make almost as much from this website called Teachers Pay Teachers as they do from their teaching job. And it's just this random sort of thing that started, I think, like between six and ten years ago where people just put lesson plans online and you can buy them for like three dollars and uh, these people are just really good at making aesthetically pleasing uh, standards meeting lesson plans and you know 15 years ago that industry didn't exist as far as I was aware so it was just sort of a weird niche opportunity that people were on the lookout for and uh, so so I think a lot of it is just uh, sort of being the right place and looking for the right place at the right time so I think that's a that's a good uh, jump to what my next question is, is is how does one get started with creating multiple streams of income? And it sounds like one place to definitely look is to what your expertise is and how you could maybe exploit that uh, to make a little bit extra. But uh, let's discuss that. Like how, how does somebody start start doing that? I mean, uh, besides, you know, look, I could go out on a Saturday and find a job somewhere, but maybe something that's a, that's a little different from that. Uh, so I got started um, by accident. Uh, I was working in marketing and I had a graphic designer friend who asked if I could do some freelance writing for her clients. Uh, one client word of mouth led to another and then all of a sudden I had to you know, create a business and contracts and an LLC and, and so it, it happens you know, bit by bit or at least it did for me and then kind of once you get that bug you want to see where how else you can make money so then I bought a house. And, it grew from there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're going to go out and create the next giant company that uh, does some big grand thing. It, it could be just something small that you're putting a couple hours into, maybe a, maybe a night or a week or whatever. Absolutely. And I think yeah. playing. Oh, sorry. I think playing to your expertise makes sense. Um, you know, uh, Lauren said that she started out when somebody asked her to write because she writes. And, you know, obviously that's what I do. But, um, but I know, I know other people who, um, make these cute little, you know, vinyl crafty things, like sayings, the words that go, <laughs> I am not a crafty person, but these little vinyl things with the sayings, you know, on the wood and they're all inspirational and stuff. And she started do decals. Yes, thank you. It's just a bumper sticker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there are these, these little vinyl things on the wood, and they go in the you know they hang them on your wall, and it's supposed to inspire you and make your home look cute. And so <laughs> she <laughs> obviously it's not what I do in my home. My home is not cute, but um, but she started doing like these on occasion and just you know putting them up in her Amazon store and then all of a sudden if she does something really cute all of a sudden she has like 40 orders and before she knew it just from doing this little hobby of hers and just putting it out there and she didn't even have to do a whole lot but you do good work and you do something you're good at and you put it out there and you know there's a chance I mean now she makes as much as her husband does at his day job so so what you're doing for diversifying your income, it doesn't necessarily have to be what you're doing as your 9 to 5. It could be whatever that hobby or, or interest that you have. And if you're good enough and you could take it to that next step or find somebody else that at least uh, has a need for it or an interest in it, you might be able to make money. Yeah, I think creating the side income can be anything from, you know, it goes kind of a range. It can be anything from just 
maybe uh, making a little bit of extra money on, on sites like Ebates or Swag Bucks or something like that, you know, making 20 or 30 extra bucks a month. And it can go all the way up to actually creating a side business and, and making thousands of dollars a month. Uh, some of the things like with, with the blogs what we have or selling products or anything like that. So it, it can be quite a range, and you don't have to necessarily do one or the other. If you just want to make a little extra money, you can do that on the side, sell some things on eBay or whatever. Or if you have a little bit of extra time and you have some expertise and you know uh, a need that you want to fill, go ahead and actually start a business. And I think that's important, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what Kyle was saying with that teachers pay teachers. You know, at some point there was probably somebody who I don't know how it started, but you know, realized that there was a real need in the marketplace for it. And if you could get in there and just figure out a way to to get other people to meet together or find what you can do and, and find other people, um, with the internet nowadays, it's so much easier for people to do that and just kind of start up a little thing and then watch it grow. You you hear these these uh, Cinderella stories all the time, how somebody starts off a, a small app or, or something else and then just grows into this monster um, that works out well for them. And even if you don't have like it growing into that monster, like Peter was saying, even if you can just do, if you start out with 20 or 30 extra dollars a month, that's still something. And that's still something you can put away. You can invest that. You can start working on growing it over time. <laughs> And how about um, as far as uh, multiple streams of income, uh, maybe along the lines of, of investing, are there ways along that line to consider? I'm not into investing, so I'll open that up. To <laughs> I mean, I do it for my retirement accounts, but it's not like an active thing where I make passive income from it. So. Yeah, you can uh, start investing in dividend funds or something along that that has some sort of income generated from it. Um, invest in peer-to-peer -peer loans or uh, just investing in general. You can you can create income from that. But uh, yeah. Well, see, and I keep I get my emergency fund in in a taxable investment account, and then it's just in a all market fund, and occasionally I get dividends from it, and it grows and. I like it better than keeping it in the savings account that pays practically nothing. So I think that helps too because it's, I mean, it's just a way of growing that money still and kind of growing my emergency fund at a better rate than using using the uh, savings account. And then if I do have to sell something and I have to sell it at a loss, at least I get a tax deduction for my emergency. So. But you do have to be careful when you're investing. Oh, um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, you, you do. do it. <laughs> which, is why, which is why I do all market funds and not stock picking. So. <laughs> so how much time Sorry. do you think? <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to jump in. And, and, you know, for a person that wants to start off, uh, maybe start creating a, a, another uh, income stream, how much time do they need to put into it? Are we talking about, like, all their waking hours? Or, you know, what can a person expect to, to maybe start up with? How could they find that time? The American Time Use Survey says that we spend almost three hours a day watching TV. So start there. I can get paid for watching TV? No, stop watching TV and do something else. <laughs> That's not nearly I know, right? <laughs> I use um, weekend mornings because I don't really sleep in, and they say it's bad for you to sleep in too much past like what your you know your normal body clock wakes up at during the week. Um, so that's when I kind of knock all my stuff out. It's like eight to twelve Saturday, Sunday, It'd be a good time. So the time is there. We just have to look for it maybe in you know that that extra hour here and there um, can do a lot. I mean, I used to do stuff from my, from my side on lunch hours, you know. Is able to squeeze it in. Or, let's ask, let's ask Tom work, about right. his. <laughs> well, there's, there's, uh, I, I, I talked to so many people that say that they, they never have time to do anything like that. Like they, they just can't find the time to, to put into a business. Probably my favorite quote of all time. And I just looked it up so I get it right. It's, it's either Gary Vaynerchuk, Vaynerchuk, um, work nine to five, spend a couple hours with your family, seven to two in the morning is plenty of time to do damage. And it, it fits quite well for me because it's pretty much the time I work. <laughs> it says seven till two in the morning. So uh, 
uh, yeah, it's there's certainly time. It just depends on if you want to prioritize that, or like Brenda said, maybe you want to sit on the couch and watch TV. Like you're how you want to sort of live your life with your spare time is is going to depend on how much you can work on these kind of side businesses. And really, I think that's that's why it's important to be doing something in your spare time that you enjoy doing. For me, I, I love doing blogging. I love writing and all the stuff that goes along with that. It's, it's kind of a hobby for me as well as a side business. So I don't mind spending four or five hours on it uh, you know, during the nights or whatever. It's actually something I enjoy doing. I like doing it to unwind. So, um, you know, if you're doing something that you really hate doing, it's going to be tough to spend three or four hours on it every night. So. Or, or to become elite at it. I think at this point I've uh, referenced the Freakonomics podcast entirely too many times. Uh, but they, uh, I, I really like the one episode they talk about how uh, if someone enjoys what they're doing versus someone who's doing it for a monetary reward, it's almost an unfair competition. Like the level of work ethic needed to overcome the fact you don't really like what you're doing is just insanely high. It almost never happens in any field. In order to be elite and to sort of get people to pay attention to you, you sort of have to like doing what you what you want on some level, especially if you're doing it as a side gig, I think, where you've put in a full work day somewhere else or you're pounding the streets looking for a full-time work gig, and then you're doing this on the side. I think you sort of, you do have to have a little bit of enthusiasm for it. And, and it becomes, at least for me, it became something healthy in a way too because I, it's so much more uh, creatively endearing for me to, to, to build the site and to do all the work that surrounds it because it's not just writing. Like Peter said, there's so many other things that go on. It's, it's creating technical or uh, fixing technical glitches and uh, designing and marketing and networking and, and so many other things. Um, but if I weren't doing this, I might just be sitting around watching a lot of TV, you know, and there's some benefit to that too. I mean, it's good to have some downtime, but I was probably wasting a lot of time, you know, before I did this. Um, where now I'm, <laughs> hopefully I'm a whole lot more productive. Um, so there's definitely that benefit to it. Well, I think with anything, it's it's going to take a lot of time at first because you're learning the ropes. Just like if you start a new job or you know any new relationship, um, it takes time in the beginning. But then once you kind of ramp up, then you can sort of ease back. So I think if you keep in mind that like end game that it is going to get easier over time, and then if you get really good, you can outsource or the things you don't like doing. Um, that's important to keep in mind, too. Yeah, I like your idea of outsourcing. I did not enjoy doing the social, you know, some of the social media stuff, and so I started outsourcing like my tweets and that kind of stuff. Some, somebody else does that. It's, I guess it's embarrassing for me to have to admit that, but you get to that point, and you're like, I'm looking at it, and I was spending like an hour a day, like, just dealing with social media and then it got to be an hour and a half a day and then it was two hours a day and I was just looking at it like do I really want to spend this much time doing it when I can pay somebody else and spend that time making more money and really on balance the amount of money I pay somebody else to take care of my stuff still you know I still make more I come out ahead so it's worth it it's funny you mentioned that example, Miranda. Uh, I just have, in my entrepreneurship class, I've got these two young women. Uh, they're 15-year-old girls, and they've decided uh, they have to actually start their own business at this point. They've gone through it. They've learned about business plans, etc. And they've decided to start up uh, a social media-based company. It's called Let's Post. And they go, uh, I'm giving them a, a free plug here on the show. <laughs> and they... They go from company to company. They're brick and mortar companies, mostly owned by baby boomers uh, and older Gen Xers in in the rural area I live in, and they're just posting to the main media sites for them. And these people are just amazed at uh, at these two young girls, and they sort of just got this company off the ground. And they thought they had no time. Uh, now they just get paid to uh, serve Facebook all day. So, a perfect example though, like that's their expertise. <laughs> And they're finding people who aren't familiar with with social media so well. So they're the just filling there. A, a perfect need right there. That's great. Yeah, it's all about finding a need and filling it and exploiting that to make income. You know, I, I did the same thing with uh, when I first started blogging. I, I started, I have a little bit of graphic design background, so I started doing my own graphics and stuff for my blog. And then I started hearing from other blogger colleagues that they needed 
uh, graphic for their site as well. And so I, you know, I, I found a need there and I started to fill that for people and actually put up a website and you know, started doing graphic, graphic design for people and it started actually making quite a bit of money. So look for places where you have some expertise and you're able to fill that need and you can actually turn that into a kind of a side business. Yeah, I think freelancers or anybody who are in kind of creative fields that play into that gig economy, especially, um, a lot more of those jobs are freelance. So there's a lot, I just, maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel like there's a lot more freelance work now than there used to be. Um, and so that's a great opportunity for extra income as well. Oh, definitely. And you can even go into consulting too. I know quite a few people who have turned their freelancing and moved into consulting and just rather than you know, providing content to people started just advising other people on how to get their content out there. It was, it's been really interesting to see the development of freelancing and the consulting and all of that online stuff as it's developed over the, the last 10, I've been doing this for 10 years. It says it's developed over the last 10 years. It's been crazy. Yeah, I mean, I was going to mention a friend of mine was once talking to me about uh, consulting work. And, you know, he was saying how he and, and some other people he knew, they were able to take their expertise at their job and consult other places or speak to other companies about what they're doing and, and create nice side incomes. You know, you forget what we do, whatever it is that you do, um, how easy it may be and how rote it is, but there's, there might be some other industry or other company or other people out there that don't quite know what they're doing at the same level and would love to have somebody consult or come in and help guide them through it and people will pay for that expertise. So let's talk about, um, you know, you, you created a, a, some side gig, you, you're doing whatever. Um, how about legal issues or, or tax issues? How do, how do you handle that? Like all of a sudden you get to a point where maybe you have to start thinking about other things. It's not just maybe a little hobby. Um, and, and maybe your accountant goes, you know, you're going to take a big hit now. We got to start, start thinking about uh, you know, ways to, to maybe reduce that. How do you go around that? You hire the accountant, <laughs> right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's what you do. Only deal in cash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only deal in cash. Don't worry about taxes, right? Don't just trade in barter. <laughs> you still have to do taxes, though, in barter. You still have to report that as income. Oh, and then and then you and then you you know deduct out the part that you gave away in barter. You still have to report that. Technically, of course. I always technically. do. Technically, yes, yes, we all always report everything on our taxes. <laughs> We're supposed to. I just think of Mad Max, and I I think of Barter Town when I when I use the word barter. So. All right, so, so you, have to, you have to seek out some some expertise out there if you really want to to take it to the next level, right? So you need a maybe a good CPA. Um, what else might you need if you if you your biz your side income is really becoming something serious? Probably a separate bank account. Um, I know for me that was pretty clutch because uh, I was mixing it all together, and then my accountant looked at me like I had seven heads when I brought in like my receipts and my like statements, and so now I keep it separate. So that's good. Uh, good records. I think that goes around along with the separate uh, separate bank accounts. But good records. Um, if you're going to hire people, you know, you may have to get different software. The accounting software that helps you keep track of everything. Um, I don't use it. Maybe Glenn can talk about QuickBooks. But <laughs> I. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, I mean, it, well, that, when I, I have a uh, an S corp. And uh, my accountant said, look, you know, you're going to have to keep uh, better records than the spreadsheet that you're bringing me every year uh, now. So I, I went and got QuickBooks. And, you know, you have to get your head around it. And it's not always so intuitive, although um, the latest incarnation of it is a lot better than it was a couple of years ago. I use QuickBooks online. Um, and one of the things I, I also use for QuickBooks is uh, my payroll. So I actually have to pay myself uh, a salary. So I have taxes coming out and, and that whole rigmarole. So QuickBooks helps take care of all of that. I really just have to press a button or two and then um, everything goes off to the state and local and all that fun stuff to take care of. Um, but it is a little more work. 
because when, when things start to grow, you have to put a little bit more into what you're doing to make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. So, um, but it's a, it's a worthwhile trade-off because as you grow, that's a good thing. Anything else that you might need to consider? Um, so you got to keep, uh, better records, separate banks, uh, keep all the money separate, basically. Uh, maybe get a good accountant, good CPA, or, or somebody that you trust. Um, yeah, for, for me, I think uh, one thing that kind of took me by surprise the first year I really started making extra income from my blog was that, that you need to be making estimated tax payments during the year. Since the, uh, in the U.S. it's a pay-as-you-go tax system and, and uh, you know, you're, you're supposed to be paying taxes throughout the year as you're making money. So after I realized that, I realized I needed to start putting some of the money that I was making aside so that I could pay, pay these estimated tax payments because if you don't, plan ahead for that stuff. It's a kind of a rude awakening and, you know, it's uh, one of the payments coming due and you don't have the money to, to pay it. So. Mm -hmm. and don't. And I, I think in the beginning you could sort of slide on it because you didn't have anything prior um, going on. But like once you've proven that you have this income coming in, uh, the IRS wants their piece. But again, that, that also depends yeah. on, on what you've um, set up and how you're, you have your company set up. So with mine, it's more of I'm all those taxes are being taken out um, through payroll, um, and then when I uh, file, rather than um, through estimated uh, taxes. And another thing, don't forget state taxes. That's actually one of the big things I didn't plan for. So when you know when I started paying my quarterly taxes, I thought I was really on top of things, but then they figured my state taxes at the end of the year and it was this big bill and it was a nightmare and it was terrible and don't forget your state taxes. So everybody wants their cut. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Everybody needs their cut. So, so if you don't already have a system telling you how much to take out, be it an accountant or, or somebody else, or, uh, put away a, a good chunk of it. I mean, what would you say? Make sure that you take 30% and, uh, and put it away. Like how much do you think those taxes are coming out to be? Yeah, thirty percent is my standard, and then whatever is left over just goes to like Hootsuite or something that I need to pay for. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, but those those are actually standard expenses. You know, I mean, we, depending on what you're doing, you're going to have uh, different expenses that you're allowed to to genuinely write off um, your bottom line. Um, but again, that's something that you also want to speak to a tax professional about. And I think also, you know, maybe something that was sort of mentioned in here, um, but not maybe directly, it was just uh, networking in general. You know, as you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to come across more people who are in your field or in related fields. And the more you can speak to other people who are doing something similar, um, the more of an advantage you have. You know, then you find out that there are other tax structures that you could have or, or things to look out for, different expenses you can take. Um, so it's a good idea to, to maybe try to find other people um, and build a rapport with them. I think that's part of how we've uh, found ourselves here too. Yeah, you know, I was going to say you can start a weekly web show. <laughs> but that came from somewhere. That came from the fact that we were all familiar with each other's work online and, um, and we networked to this point. This didn't just come out of uh, thin air. That's true. I think any side business, I would challenge anyone who's starting out with like a, a side stream of income to find somebody who didn't sell their first cake or Avon product to their mom or their friend or you know, the first freelance cake that came from a friend. I think inherently side incomes, especially when you're selling a product or service, come from networking and referrals. I think yeah. that's a good point. Yep. I mean... The idea that you know you have to rely on on your immediate family and friends to keep buying from you is kind of a scary thought, really. When you get right down to it, I, I like that point of you know watching out for that and and looking and, and building a network that's actually in that field rather than just trying to make money off your friends and family all the time. Although that can be a great way to start and find out if what you have to offer really does have some sort of market. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad business model when you have a huge French-Canadian family. Uh, I'm sure at least indirectly half my book sales come from family reunion-related uh, pitches. 
the, the guilt pitch at the, the family dinner? Is that it? <laughs> Everyone could use more help with money, buy more money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'd love to buy. Okay, I have one in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> The traveling salesman. Available on Amazon or my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will buy it, but you're going to buy it right now. <laughs> so, I mean, you, uh, go ahead. One thing you mentioned also is about uh, trying to see what works as far as making income, too. And I think that's an important thing, too. A lot of times you can try a whole bunch of different things to make money. You know, there have been times when I, I've been juggling seven or eight different things trying to make money. and uh, when you're doing that, I think it's it's good to do that, but also it's good to realize when you've got too many balls that you're juggling up in the air, and you know they're bound to come crashing down at some point. So it's a good idea to think about where you want to focus your attention at some point, and figure out which things are actually uh, producing good income and whether they're sustainable, and and then if they are, think about focusing on those things. Because if you try to juggle too many balls all at once for too long, you can uh, end up leading to, to burnout, too. So you have to start to build a nose for what's actually working and then maybe go with that. Exactly. Yep. So we've talked a lot about um, side incomes and diversifying your income. Um, I mean, there are a lot of great benefits that we talked about. Let's maybe briefly talk about some of the drawbacks because let's be real, there, there are some real drawbacks to trying to, to take your time to do something else. Well, you can get consumed by it and have a hard time finding that balance, especially if you have a family. I think that can get is probably one of the biggest challenges for a lot of people who get serious about making a lot of income. If you're if you're just trying to make you know a, a couple hundred bucks a month, then you're probably not going to need to put in a bunch of time. But if you're really trying to build up a side business, then it can really start getting into your family time and start you know, messing up that, that balance you have in your life if you're not careful. Yeah, to Miranda's point, I think um, it, it's a bandwidth type thing with side incomes. It's like even if you're just making $100, it's like something you have to think about, take care of, and nurture and grow, make sure you don't drop the ball. And so then you find yourself juggling all these balls, and, and sometimes it does get really overwhelming. Even if you don't have a family or, you know, anything else to balance, it just it can feel like a lot sometimes. And you don't want to do something, uh, sorry, but something that that'll become a, a detriment to what you're doing um, for your career or full time. You know, where maybe you, you might lose that full time income uh, because you're spending so much on on the side income that may not be making as much. I mean, I, I think at some point for some people they're lucky enough to maybe have that tipping point where um, a side income might exceed what they're their primary income is, and it's no longer a side income, um, and that's a nice problem to have, and I think we could probably discuss that in, in a whole other show, but um, you don't want it to be so all-consuming all where you're really losing out on everything else. Yeah, I was just going to say that one of the con real cons of, of trying to make side income is that you can become way too focused on it, and, and it can be kind of a tunnel vision that's, you know, you get home and you want to work on your, your side projects and, and start creating more income because it can be a, a real high when you s see those dollars start coming into your PayPal account or the checks coming in the mail. It's like, wow, you know, I, I didn't think I could make any money doing this, but now I, d I just got a check for $1,000 from this one company or whatever. So it can be really almost uh, addicting uh, making that side income. And, and you can start to uh, let other things slide like your relationships or Maybe you're not spending as much time with your kids as you want to or, or whatever. So you really do have to make an effort to make sure you're not letting other things slide. You, yeah. you also have to watch out for the money investment too, not just the time investment. Like if, if you're talking dividend investing for, for dividends, you don't want to just go in there with the idea of I'm going to sink every spare dollar I have into these stocks and I'm going to make all this money and then you just wipe yourself out. It's uh, Or... Uh, or go to a, a, a workshop about how to invest in real estate, and they they, they try to sell sell you on all this stuff, and it's it's not going to uh, you're out the money again, and you might never make a dollar. So you got to kind of watch what you do with your money too, not just your time. Uh, it's, it's not all sort of free free money to make. Yeah, and that's a great point there too. Uh, you know, 
uh, there's a lot of promises of side income um, and a lot of get rich schemes, get rich quick schemes that are out there and people promising this and that. Um, but most of them probably are schemes. If it sounds too good to be true, uh, you probably want to run away from it. You know, you'll end up spending more money than anything will actually happen. And uh, you have to be careful. There's a lot of people out there that, that are really building up their businesses by just trying to take yours and doing anything else. Yeah. Next week on the Money Mastermind Show, how to make a lot of money with a side income by showing others how to have side incomes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watch out for the expert that really just talks about something and uh, they make all their Max, money off. Max out your credit cards to do renovations. <laughs> <laughs> when they themselves can't really uh, do it. So uh, we, We've talked a lot about side incomes and I think it's great and I think it's something that um, a lot of people should look into. And, and at, at the talk here, um, we talked a lot about how millennials and uh, freelancing um, that's maybe going to be the new reality too, right? Where uh, you're not going to have the long job and um, maybe you need to get into that mindset of always being able to kind of do that next thing because you, you might be jumping from, from job to job and you got to be on your toes and figure out different ways to make money. Um, and that note, I, I think we could uh, we'll start to wrap up and what we'd like to do here is do a final word on our subject. So we'll go around our panel here and uh, do a final uh, final word on creating multiple sources of income. So uh, let's start with Kyle. Uh, what's your final word? Well, perhaps from a millennial perspective, I guess, uh, what I was thinking when you were just sort of wrapping there, Glenn, was uh, freelancing is a great way to make some side coin. But in addition to that, uh, with everyone going into freelancing, there's some really great opportunities to take advantage of that supply. Uh, and, and be an entrepreneur. Do your own thing. I mean, uh, like Tom says, be careful with how much you invest, time and money, but uh, as long as you're somewhat cautious, there's not a whole lot to lose there. Just try something. Just start. Great. And Miranda, your final word? Yeah, I think that it's just important to make sure you're not relying too heavily on one income source. I know in my case, my big goal for this coming year is to work on diversifying my revenue streams because it's I was looking at it and it's all sort of consolidated and you know I have a couple of really big clients right now and a couple of really big projects but what happens you know if that gravy train ends so I'm kind of looking at diversifying my revenue streams because you can't keep doing the same thing over and over again anymore in this economy and you can't expect to have the same things and so you need to be ready for that and and so just recognizing the importance of that and not becoming complacent is important. Oh gosh, I said important a lot. <laughs> that's a pretty important word. That's, that's, <laughs> Very that's, important. That's the new you know for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Peter, what's your final word? All right, well my, my final word is, is uh, side income is basically a way to create more buffer in your life to give you uh, more options and more freedom. Um, you know, for for me, one of the main reasons I started trying to create side income was because my wife was going to be staying home with our son, and I just wanted to be able to re replace some of her income. Um, so I just started trying this, that, and the other thing to try to make money. I was probably, at one time or another, probably had 10 or 12 different things up in the air trying to figure out ways to make money. Um, but in the end, I, I was able to focus on a few, few things that were actually working and uh, work hard at those things and if you do work hard and put in some time you're likely going to be able to make some money so just start doing something that you enjoy maybe something you have some expertise in and just get started and Tom what's your final word uh, we spent a lot of the show telling people that's kind of difficult to make money but it can also be kind of easy um, <laughs> thanks to the internet like if you have some stuff to get rid of you can sell it online uh, with Etsy or Etsy, uh, eBay or, or, or Kijiji, if you're creating something, yeah, you, you can sell it on Etsy. You can design T-shirts, sell them on Teespring. Like th there's a website to make money on almost anything that you could possibly do. Uh, if you, if you have any technical skills or freelancing, there's there's things like Elance and Odesk. There's there's just there's literally a website to make money on almost anything. You don't have to design your own website by any means. And Lauren, if you'll close our final word with your final word on creating multiple streams of income. Sure. Um, I say just do it. Um, 
do it while you're young, do it while you, you know, have the time and the bandwidth to have the hustle look around you and um, use some of that income to pay off debt and set yourself up for later on in life. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, technical difficulties notwithstanding. Um, tell our, our audience out there uh, where they can find out a little bit more about you and the work that you do. Uh, you can find out more about me at LB, that's um, B-E-E, -E, like Bumblebee, and TheMoneyTree.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter or Instagram at LB Money Tree, So. All right, so make sure you go out and check that, LB and the Money Tree .com. Thank you, Lauren, again for joining us, and thank you, everybody, for watching the Money Mastermind show. Thank you, and until next week, be good with your money. Good night. Thanks for joining us on the Money Mastermind Show. Get more information at moneymastermindshow.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on Google+.